ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Jeff asked if I might share my memories and what I know about the Elhart family, our family that came uh, uh, over here in the late 1800s. And actually, I didn't know this, but in the 1700s, the Elhart family, as we know them, were German, lived in Germany. And in the early 1800s, they came to the Netherlands to live. And in the late 1800s, they came uh, across the Atlantic and settled in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That would have been my great-grandfather and grandmother. Uh, I'm not sure about uncles. Of course, my grandfather, and there were two other boys in that family, three actually, uh, Uncle Ben Elhart, uh, uh, got appendicitis when he was 16 years old and died from that. In those days, if you got appendicitis, there wasn't much cure. So anyway, that's a story. And um, settled in Grand Rapids, and my grandpa there uh, did um, construction work, apparently on city roads, um, did some shoveling and work. And um, the story goes that one Saturday afternoon, they gave him, with his pay envelope, a note and said, of course, he talked Dutch, so he, he had it written in, in English, take that down to the drugstore, and the druggist will read it to you. And he took it to the drugstore, and the, the druggist read it, and it said, don't come back to work Monday, the job is done. So here he is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, can hardly speak English, and... Uh, needing some income, and they moved to South Blendon, South Blendon, and settled there on a farm. Now, I don't know whether they had to clear the land or the land had been partially cleared, but uh, he, they started growing produce there, and because my dad was the youngest, he would take my dad along with the team and wagon filled with produce to Jenison, Granville, in and uh, uh, West Grand Rapids, and it did that all day long. And on the towards the end of the day, uh, it was time to go home. And they lived off Port Sheldon Road, so th they went back through Granville Jenison to Port Sheldon Road, and then they were six seven miles from where they lived. So they would lay down then in the wagon, cover with a horse blanket, and sleep, and the horses found them their way home, and when they stopped in the front of the barn door, it meant that they were home and they could get out, put the horses away, water them and feed them, and go back to bed themselves. So that's the story of the Elharts in the uh, in the early days in, in South London. And from there, my grandfather, uh, they sold the farm, moved to Zealand, and he had a gravel pit, and he hauled gravel to most of the driveways and many of the cement jobs that were on there, and he had uh, one team of mules and three horse, three teams of horses. So he had four wagons going during the day delivering, delivering gravel. Um, I was born in, uh, of course, in, in May 19, 1929, Holland Hospital, and soon after my birth, uh, the the depression came along. And uh, was tough, tough going for my parents. Dad had a they he had a home paid for, new, or not paid for, but a new home built, and uh, we were living there, living well. And they had uh, lost his job, and so to survive, they moved to a farm north of Lowell. That was my mother's homestead, and it was vacant, and uh, so. The, the decision was to move out there and attempt to make a living on the farm. But the farm had been vacant for a bit and was in disrepair. And uh, the house had several broken windows and it was a mess. But they had four cottages that my grandfather had built and they rented. So they moved there and spent the winter in a cottage with no insulation, built up on, on barrels so the, the, it was open, grand, open underneath the the cottage, and of course, the walls and all. So I don't know how they survived. My sister Clara was a creeper at that time, and I was a couple of years old, 
and they survived the winter, and he worked then on this farm. He had one horse, and one of the neighbors had one horse, and normally when you work with horses, you work with a team with two, so they traded. One day, one would use the horses, the next day, the other one, and uh, survived. So he tells the story, he told the story that he went apparently to the building bank to borrow money to buy some seed and maybe some livestock, I'm not sure. But anyway, come fall, he didn't have all the money to pay back the loan. And they were foreclosing on some of these farms and he was a nervous wreck and scared to death that we'd be living out in the street. So he dressed my sister Claire and I in our best Sunday school clothes. And he took us with him to the bank and introduced us to the banker, thinking surely the banker wouldn't th foreclose on us. And it must have worked because we stayed on the farm. And one other thing I wanted to, oh, the school that I went to was Mosley School, and Mosley was a little community north of Lowell, seven miles, and that's where, in those days, you had a little corner grocery store, and you had a, a creamery they processed for cheese, had um, a train depot, of course, was right there, blacksmith shop, in the little red schoolhouse, brick schoolhouse, outside plumbing. And we, my mother had gone to that school and graduated, and later took a train each day to building to go to school to, to, to the ninth grade, and that's as far as she went. Well, anyway, I managed to get through um, the Mosley School. Part of the time I had a classmate, part of the time I didn't. There was only 13, 14 kids in the whole school, and she, one teacher took care of them all. So I graduated from, from the uh, eighth grade, and my dad figured at that time I didn't really need to go on for further education, that I was big enough to work on the farm and he needed help. Uh, my mother intervened in that, and they had a quite a discussion and, and decided that I really should go on to high school. So I did, so I went from a class of just myself to two or three students to 90, and it was quite, quite a change. And then all of a sudden they, they, noted, they posted that they were going to have a, a, a class election. And I said, that sounds like fun. I should be the class president. So I run, and I was elected. And the first, the first class meeting general meeting, I had no clue what parliamentary procedure was, never heard of it, didn't know anything about how you would handle a, a, a meeting like that. And bless his heart, there was a teacher that, um, I, I don't know that he was our Sunday school teacher, maybe his wife was, but felt sorry for me and sat in a chair behind me and said, I'll tell you what to say. He said, the meeting will now come to order. And I said, the meeting will now come to order. And uh, I got, got the hang of it. And it worked because for many years after that, it was the meeting will now come to order. So I made it. I survived. Then, of course, I got... Uh, my dad, we'd lost our mother at a young, young age. And my dad decided to sell the farm and move back to Holland. That's where his family was. And uh, I had two younger sisters, and I think he was looking for his, his sisters to help with them. So uh, I got a job in what was Reeling Motor Sales. Now it's Barbara Ford for working six and a half days a week. And I got $28 for it. And I, it was really good. And the nice part of it is that it's Sundays, I still didn't have to get up to milk cows. So I I had part of a day off. I had the day off. Anyway, six months I worked there, and I thought I was doing a pretty good job. So I, th I asked them if I could have a raise of $2 for $30. They said, no, they didn't think they could afford it. So, so I stayed for my 28 and then Mr. Barber came along 
And I asked him for $2, and he paid it. So I got my $2 raise. Um, then, of course, came uh, the started uh, dating, of course, noticing girls. And, and uh, Jeff and Wayne's mom, Barbara, and I married in uh, June 10th in 1950. And um, we we year and a half later the Korean War broke out, and so and, and they were drafting, and so I enlisted, and that's where I enlisted and stayed in the Coast Guard, so that I could go to school and get a rating and get a little more money because we had forty dollar house payments, and if we didn't really save, we couldn't make those forty dollars. So I knew I needed some additional income. Um, I think I got a couple other things on my mind here. Uh, Barb, uh, <clears throat> Wayne, and in uh, and Jeff's mother and I joined the Methodist Church here in 1950. Same year we were married, and uh, I stayed. I served on the on the finance committee there, and uh, also in in overseeing the county of the of the collections and the deposits of those. And and uh, when I got out of the service, went back to Barbara Ford for work until 1965, when I became a Pontiac GMC dealer, and that kind of wraps it up for, for the moment. So I'm Jeff Elhart, one of Ken's two sons, uh, my brother Wayne, and I had the fortunate uh, pleasure of having Dad as our father, as well as our mentor in business and in life, and our, our coach. And uh, I just want to ask um, Ken, a uh, few questions about uh, his life that he's already talked about, uh, some of his past and his family, as well as his uh, professional career, his uh, service career, as well as his retirement uh, time. So, um, Dad, I've got a few questions dating back to your um, ancestry. And I've got a photo here, and it's a photo that has to be it looks like there's 100 people in here. It's probably not, but it was the annual Elhart reunion in Johnson Park. I think that was in Granville, Granville. August 3 of 1938. So you would have been nine years old, I think, at that time. Right. And um, so um, maybe you can just, you can look at it and point out, uh, and we can get a picture of this on the screen. But who do you recognize in there? Well, I recognize me right there. Okay. And uh, this was George Moose, a cousin. This is my sister, Clara. And if I can sh find my... This is my dad. And this is my mother. Interesting story. Uh, when the Earhart's came to Michigan... Uh, one of the brothers, the oldest son of my grandparents, stayed in the Netherlands. He had a good job with the Netherlands government and decided that he didn't want to take the risk of uh, coming over here. So anyway, a few years ago, we got a call from, from Jack DeWitt, uh, from the DeWitt Hatchery and then Big Dutchman, and it was his mother who was, who was the, the girl that my grandparents brought over, my great-aunt Tilly. And uh, they called whoever they knew in the Netherlands, last name Elhart, and to come over and visit. And so we went to meet them. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, you spell your name wrong here. In the Netherlands, it's A-E-L-H-A-R-D-T. And I brought this picture along, one like it, and I said, I want you to know that they produced here and expanded. He said, I've got that picture. 
that your grandpa sent to my grandpa in the Netherlands, and it's all written in Dutch, who belongs to who, which I thought was, was really neat. Lovely people. They're almost as nice as the Michigan Dutch. So anyway, we enjoyed the afternoon. That's great. And um, you had two sisters um, growing up. You had uh, Aunt Clara and Aunt Joanne. I had someone bring to me a picture just uh, a week or two ago, and um, and in there is Aunt Joanne yep. when she was Dutch dancer. That's right, with her girlfriends. Uh, this was 1957, and she was Dutch dance and did... Uh, and did that easier, and she was cheerleader for the high school. So, and uh, tell us about Aunt Joanne. Uh, she was your younger sister, right? Yep. Aunt Joanne got mesothelioma, and she had in in uh, she passed away. We lost her when she was thirty seven years old. Uh, she had three sons. Uh, the youngest at that time was eight. One was eleven, and one was sixteen. I remember they one of the the younger birthdays. It was John's birthday was going to be the day, really, of her funeral, and we said we can't do that. So, I had a birthday with birthday cake and some presents for John, and then the next day had the funeral. And the kids, the two younger ones, the nine, eleven year old. I got a call from them in the summer. She died in the spring. Uncle Ken, yeah. And they told me who they were, John and Joel. said, do you have a job for us? And I said, well, what do, you, what do you need? Well, we'd like to buy some bicycles, and we're looking for a job. And I said, I think we have a job for you. And our office manager at the time lived near them. And she brought them in each, each day. And uh, i think of things, empty the wastebaskets, do that. They'd come running back up. Now what we're going to do, Uncle Ken? And I thought, I'm working harder now than I did before without these kids here. But they had to have a place during the day that Dad, Dad was working. And so I said to my dad, Grandpa, you're going to take those kids a couple of days a week to your house and work in the garden. So between us, we got them handled, and they made enough money to buy their bikes, and everybody was happy. And your other sister was Clara, and tell us a little bit about Clara's life. Uh, she had a uh, she had a, a interesting and uh, life um, her whole life. And tell us about Clara and, and her and her children. Uh, Clara uh, lived till last summer. She was eighty six uh, and died of pancreatic cancer. But she was fourteen when we lost our mother, and she really from there on in, accepted the role of lady of the house. Now, we did have, or my dad finally hired a, a widow lady who was living with her son and daughter-in-law, and she came and worked five days a week to help make some meals and so on. But Claire, at 14, uh, made a, a dinner for the thrashers. In those days, they worked in working bees. They'd help, four or five thrashers would help the neighbor, and then they'd help them back, and that's how they got their work done. And to come noon, it's time to water the horses and have dinner, and she had the dinner ready for them. I can see them pat her on the back yet and thank her for what she'd done. But she, And then when we moved uh, to Holland, she worked for a while in the uh, Ford garage in the office in Barbara Ford, and then she married a Jim Slaw here, from here in town, and he got a job in Grand Rapids, and so they moved there. But she worked um, in, in accounting um, most all of, until she retired. She raised a family with, those, with uh, two sons, three sons and a, and a daughter, nice kids. And, uh, you know, kept a house and, and uh, worked in Verhagen, in Hudsonville for many, many years. She was a great gal. Little bossy by times, but a great gal. <laughs> and she battled uh, pancreatic cancer for quite a long time. How long? Five years. She had, uh, they thought, six months to a year, but she was just, a, they couldn't understand why, but she just kept going. And she, she 
but she was always an organizer. Before she went in for her chemotherapy or radiation, she she made a casserole. So she, if she felt bad, she still had something to eat. And uh, just a, a great, great lady, but always planning. Uh, and she, she unfortunately had uh, a similar uh, unfortunate unfortunate experiences as, as you did as a parent uh, to someone that uh, died by, from a mental illness by suicide. Yes. Um, Mark Sla, her, her youngest son, um, dealt with depression and, and had serious depression and then been in Pine Rest and then he was living with her for a while and uh, she felt that he was good enough where she could go to Florida for a week to visit friends and she did and he was uh, to, to to go to work back at Sly Furniture he was a furniture finisher uh, the day after she was coming home and uh, on, when she got home he had just taken his life it was a real shock left two little boys a little boy and a little girl and wife alone to, to, to raise them um, and, um, then of course, uh, uh, Clara and Aunt Joanne, and tell us a little bit about Grandpa Ted. Uh, so Gra my Grandpa Ted, your father, Ted, um, when he got done farming, uh, what did he do for a living and where did he work and how, where did he retire and at what age? Grandpa sold the farm, and he was not yet 60 years old, and he came to town, and uh, he got a job for Turhar Auto, which at that time was a Buick Pontiac dealership, and uh, selling used cars, and it didn't go well at first, and the story goes that, that uh, Mr. Turhar was coming to the used car lot to tell him that he thought maybe he wasn't cutting, cut out for sales. And he had a customer, so he went back to the, the, the other building, and uh, he thought he'd, he'd let him go later. Well, he sold the car. So he thought he'd give him another chance, and he progressed. And he, he uh, made a good living selling uh, cars. And then General Motors come in to, to, to hire auto and said, you know, you're going to have to put up a new building. We're, the building they were in was where the center of the arts is now, and there's no room for display of newer used cars. And uh, he said, you're going to have to give up one of your franchises or build a new facility where there's room. And uh, Mr. Terhard decided to give up Buick and keep Pontiac for sales. And my dad, when, of course, then they had more salespeople than what they needed, so Dad elected to go with Buick to Vandenberg Buick, and he worked there for a number of years. And uh, then when I become a Pontiac GMC dealer, I said, you know, Dad, when I'm selling Fords and you're selling Buicks, we're really not in competition, but we could be now. And if you'd like to come to work with me, I'd love to have you. And so that's what happened. So he came and, and he worked, and he, he had to be 70 at least, and this, he'd always, we had a sales board like we have now. And if we, we were out for a ride after he retired and he hadn't been around the dealership, he'd have to go in and, and tell Grandma that he had to use a bathroom, but he really had to check, check the sales board, see how things are going. You never get over worrying about your kids. And, and these guys, too, you know, I, I can, if I had a nickel for every time I run upstairs, the collision center, I'd have a lot of money because that's first thing you go is to see how things are going. Yeah, that still doesn't change. It happens all the time. Well, sales, how were sales yesterday? So, yeah. So, Grandpa uh, helped me sell my very first car in 1976. It was an American Motors AMC uh, Hornet Sportabout, Chartreuse Green. Uh, sold it to Russ Jessick. Uh, partner with the Jessic brothers, now the Aldine Marina. And um, uh, I'll never forget, uh, he would take me down to City Kitchen down in Zealand for strawberry shortcake now and then. And I understand that you like to do that once in a while with your grandkids. Is that true? Oh, yeah, that's fun to do that. 
we've done that with both boys, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And uh, Grandpa died in 1982. He was born in, in 1900, um, and he's 82 years old. And I think he sold his last car about within two months of— but let's go back to a second when he was in the hospital. He, he had colon cancer. And when he was in the hospital, tell tell uh, the folks what he wanted uh, to do while he was there. Well, you know, he said, I don't have anything to do here. And there's people here that just are, are laying here doing nothing and not reading or anything. You bring some literature down. I'll give them some literature. And maybe they one of them will want to buy a car. <laughs> and then he'd say, now, when uh, uh, you... You're ready. You go down and see one of those nice young boys at Wayne and Jim DeGraff, and they'll help you out. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. He was a great mentor, that's for sure. Thing he did, and he took Wayne with him when Wayne was still quite young. He believed that every barbershop should have new Pontiac literature. They shouldn't have to look at magazines when they could look at new car literature. So he'd go around the whole area, Holland, Zealand, Berkulo, all the places, and, and drop off literature. The good old days, that's right. Um, and uh, if we move on to um, some of the things that you really enjoyed um, when you were weren't working was boating. Uh, and I found a actually got this. This is from the Escanaba Daily Press, and it's visiting boatmen find Escanaba a popular place to tie up for a week or a weekend. Pictured in the yacht basin are the angel in the foreground with a harmony of East Lansing, wide track of Holland, errant of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, the snoozer, boozer, cruiser of Kalamazoo, and the Lindy of Milwaukee at dock along the harbor wall. Uh, this was in Escanaba. Do you remember? I remember that, and I remember a young man that was with us that he brought his golf clubs along. I didn't golf. His mother didn't golf, but he had his golf clubs with him. And we had a, a dinghy and put his golf clubs in that and went across the Sturgeon Bay Canal over to a golf course and played golf. And who was that? That was you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a lot of fun on our boat trips. So of all the boat trips that you and it took our family on, is there anyone that, that really stands out or any, any particular time on – on that, uh, that that you would want to remember. And, and there's a picture of that boat here, a 27-foot Chris Craft. We wanted to go to Mackinac City and Mackinac Island, and we left, I think, Charlevoix, and we got up to make the turn to go down under the bridge into Mackinac City, and the wind picked up, and it rained, and it really, really was tough. We got behind a freighter and followed him. Then we had to leave him and go down into to Mackinac City. And we got there and got tied up. And I forget whether it was you or your brother, but all you could say is, Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. And it was frightening. And I thought, you, Elhart, you really, really screwed up this time, taking those little boys and their mother out in this weather. But we made it. Yeah. That was me. And what did mom say? Did she uh, Was she excited to get back out on the water? No, she wasn't too anxious to get back. No. <laughs> but we had a great day coming back. We put the top convertible top down. It was just a beautiful ride. But you know, in boating, that's the way it is. And Dad, uh, you served in the Coast Guard, as you mentioned. Um, there's some photos here uh, of the Coast Guard that we'll, we'll get to, but um, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, why you chose the Coast Guard uh, during the Korean conflict, and uh, first of all, why you chose the Coast Guard, and then um, what you did in terms of schooling and where you served uh, while you are at the Coast Guard. Well, I knew I was going to be drafted, and I didn't have any problem with that other than I didn't know how long it would be. And secondly, I wasn't sure that I could go to school and get any advancement, which would give us another 5 or $10 a, a month to make our house payment. And so I was ready to join the Navy or the Air Corps, and uh, some young men come in the used car lot. I was selling used cars at Barber Ford. 
And we're talking about what we're going to do. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to enlist in either Navy or Air Corps. And they said, well, but I said, it's four years, and I really don't want to be gone four years if I don't have to. And they said, well, you can get in the Coast Guard for three years. And that got my attention, went right down to the recruiting office. And uh, he said, well, we're booked up for six months. And so I was visiting with him and ready to leave. And uh, got a call, they got a call from the doctor that he didn't approve one of their recruits that they were taking to send to California the following week. And he looked at me and said, there's your chance if you want to list right away. And I said, can I have one day? I, I really need to go to where I work and explain what I'm up to to them. And he said, you'll be back. And he gave me a time the next day. And so talked with Mr. Barber, and he said, you do what you need to do and what you think you should do, and, and that'll be fine. Just come back when you're through. And so we went back and, and uh, said, I was would like to do that. So I got past the physical, and then I had to pass the color blind test. And that was a book that you opened and had all these dots, and it, it had numbers in these dots. I couldn't see any numbers. And, and he <laughs> kid shook his head. He said, don't, when you, he said, it's too late for me to flunk you out, but when you get there and they enter you in, you go through your physical again, they're going to have this book. You listen to where those numbers are. 3, 42, 21. And so I listened Four or five guys ahead of me. By the time he got to me, it was three, four, and didn't see a thing. And he said, now, whatever you do, don't ask to be in electronics because it's all color-coded, and you, you just won't work for you. So that's what happened. So after basic training, um, they were placing us and sending us out to places of, that they needed us. They were recommissioning destroyer escorts that the Navy had mothballed, and they were patrolling off Korea with them. And uh, that was one of the reasons they were enlisting so many Coast Guardsmen. And so I, they, I went up to the, the yeoman, the, the office kid, and uh, he said, what did you, you do before you got in here? I said, old used cars. He said, Joe, what do you do with the used car salesman? And I said, I'd like to go to diesel engine school if I could. I thought I can use that around the garage and all and the theory of it. And uh, actually, the diesel engines that powered those destroyer escorts were the same engines that powered the Mackinac. So I thought it would be kind of fun. So they shipped me to Ella, uh, to Groton, Connecticut, where the, the Coast Guard had a big training station for radio operators, gunners, mates, and whatever, and uh, went through diesel engine school there and come back, had a, had a few days leave, and then I had to report in uh, to Cleveland Coast Guard headquarters. I had asked to be on the lakes if I could when I graduated from Benjamin School, and, the, and I got it. And so I went to see the personnel officer, and I said, I, I've got a house in Lake Michigan, and I've got house payments, and it would sure be nice if you have an opening on Lake Michigan. I'd like, I'd like a shot at it. And he looked at me, and he said, what would you join this outfit for? I said, because I didn't want to go to the Army. <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and I thought, I'll wind up at a lighthouse in Alaska through all this shenanigans. But anyway... Uh, the kid, the yeoman, typed up all my papers, and he said, how do you want to go? Typically, they will give you a, a coupon deal, and you just hand that, and the government pays your way. Or you can go on your own, and normally you can save a little money that way. I said, I'll go on my own. And I, I, said, uh, I said, I'll give you a map. It's a little town way up in Michigan. I said, where is it? He said, Muskegon, Michigan. I said, I can find it. And so... I checked in, and the, the reason, apparently, that, that I got to go there is all their boats. They had three boats there, and they were all gas-driven. And they were due to get their first 
diesel-powered patrol boat. And I guess they figured, you know, I could at least check the oil in that. So I was in. And uh, I, I, there was a, a chief mechanic and then a second one and me, the fireman. So uh, whenever one of them got transferred, got promoted and transferred, I slipped into his place. So it worked. I never had to leave. Looked like I might be transferred at one time, but it didn't work. So it worked out well. And in uh, December 4 of 55, it was time for me to, to, to leave. And the officer in charge of the group at Grand Haven, was, I was, we were under them. He did his best to, to uh, talk me into re-enlisting. And I said, no, I don't think I need to do that. So here I am. There you go. And you had a, some um, pretty interesting experiences when you were in the Coast Guard. And I've got an article here, if I can put my finger on it. Um, Let you take the mic here. Well, hang on a second. So this is an article from uh, the Muskegon Chronicle of February 6, 1954, Coast Guard Rescue Shivering Pup. And I'll just read this article. We'll get a shot on it on the screen. Coast Guard uh, crash boat returns to its berth after the crew pulled a dog from the icy waters of Muskegon Lake. Uh, Coast Guardman on the channel wall use boat hooks to push ice flows aside to permit the wa um, boat to enter. Heinz is the name of the dog. The rescued pup is a shivering, sad little dog as he huddles in a jacket, one of the crew buttoned around him. Uh, EN2C, was that your, that's you. Kenneth Elhart offers the half-frozen pup a pan of warm milk as he sits under the radiator. I didn't know dogs drink milk. <laughs> and uh, and Jerry Bernard, an employee of Sand Products Corporation, where Heinz is official mascot, reclaims a pet, wraps him in a blanket, and sighs in relief. Um, so, you remember that? Yes. There in the winter in Muskegon Lake, uh, the car ferries run all winter. Is did the Highway 16 in Milwaukee Clipper delivering uh, rail cars and automobiles? So they kept a, a center was open in the channel, and the fishermen and, and pets would get out on this ice, and then all of a sudden the wind would change, and it would blow it out, and they'd be afloat on these ice packs, uh, fishermen too. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, it was quite often that we'd have to go and and rescue them out from the ice flow. So that's how that all came about. You also uh, experienced something there that uh, very few people have seen. Uh, more people, particularly uh, that live along the coast of Lake Michigan, see occasionally. And it's a phenomenon that happens only at certain times. You want to explain what that is? I don't know what it is. I really don't. Other than you swear, you can almost see the traffic lights across the lake. I called one night at 2 in the morning to the officer in charge and said, Chief, there's some lights out there. I don't know whether it's a cruise ship or what it is. And he come over and he said, no, this happens occasionally. Whether it's the atmosphere or what, I'm not sure. But it does happen. A lot of people don't believe it, but it does. Yeah, yeah. You called me one night and said, Jeff, on a Sunday night, about 10 o'clock, go outside with your binoculars and take a look. And sure enough, you could see the weathermark buoy halfway across the lake like it was just 20 feet away, blinking solid red. So, Dad, let's talk a little bit more about your experience um, while you were in the Coast Guard when you are in Muskegon. Uh, I've got a picture of here of this. Uh, this looks like a car carrier. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that uh, car carrier and what you remember about that? Yes. In fact, our senior class trip we took on that from Muskegon to Milwaukee and back. Uh, and what was it called? The Milwaukee Clipper. The Milwaukee Clipper was a little bit like a mini cruise ship. It had it did have uh, berthing, but it had a dance band and and a lot of partying and so on. Uh, and run uh, twelve months a year, and it did haul some cars along with with the Highway 16, which is another carrier. And uh, 
Funny thing, the captain on this boat, Captain Hoxie, was a very proud guy, and he'd call the Coast Guard station. Um, the Muskegon Chronicle would call the Coast Guard station, want to know if the car ferries and the clipper was making it through the ice coming into the harbor. And the, and the officer in charge, Chief First, said, whatever you do, don't say they're stuck in the ice because Captain Hoxie is very proud, and he'll not be happy if you say he got stuck in the ice. I'll never forget that. Everybody's got their story. <coughs> and everybody's got to stay in business, right? <clears throat> So as we move on um, from there, you you mentioned that you work for Barber Ford, and you uh, probably get a lot of your training working for Mister Mister Barber, and uh, went to school to uh, become uh, a leader in the in the car business. And I've got a fic- picture of here of uh, an old looks like a mansion. Why don't you tell us about this? Mr. Barber uh, was a great guy, a hardworking person, and he sent me to, uh, Ford called it Dealer Sun Schools, but it was Dealer Merchandising School, and it was training to be a general manager of an auto dealership, and it was held at the estate of Henry Ford. And this picture is a Henry Ford estate, and we, uh, our classrooms was in uh, the garage he had a would have hold a dozen Model T Fords, I'm sure, in its day. But that was where our classroom was, um, and a great school. I'm thankful that I had an opportunity to go. So, um, what what was your uh, when you're in the Ford business? Um, what was the most memorable Ford product that you remember selling? My first new car sale. Was a was a uh, Ford Crestliner, and it was just a customized Ford interior and a beautiful outside paint job of dark bronze with light tan. Uh, just a pretty pretty car. I was very proud of that, and enjoyed it a lot. And sold it to a, a young man whose parents come in with him from Jamestown, and bought it and took delivery of it. And that was uh, probably the one I'll never forget from Ford. And um, was the Mustang, uh, did that come out prior to you uh, getting into business on your own with Pontiac and GMC in 1965? Yes, it came out, um, and it just was real popular and cute, and everybody needed one. So all we could get, we could sell. And they had a contest for the sales manager of Ford dealers. And if you won this contest, you got to buy a Mustang at dealer cost and, and above quota for the dealer, and we won it. And your mother drove that Mustang uh, for oh, several months. And then when we went in business, I turned it in as part of the capitalization of the business. And I think I, I uh, declared it worth $2,100. Can you imagine that? $2,100 for a brand-new Mustang. <laughs> and pretty interesting story in terms of uh, – uh, first of all, when you were downtown on 8th Street, the dealership, uh, main dealership, was where the Holland Arts Council building is, next to Skiles on, on 8th Street. But your used car lot was Kitty Corner, where um, uh, next to where the Pizza Hut was on uh, Columbia between 8th and 7th. And tell us a little bit about um, h- how many cars you used to stock and who ran the used car department and who ran the new car department? Typically, uh, depending upon how late a model the trade-ins were, 20 cars was all I could have financially. If I had 21, I had to quit get, a one, get, get rid of one, or I wouldn't be able to meet payroll. So it was it was tight. And this, uh, where the car, the used cars were, were, the Pizza Hut and the old Becker Iron and Metal business was, and it had a little garage and, and uh, office, and it had a wood stove in it, so we'd fire it up in the morning and in the winter and, and get it warmed up and then just let the fire go out for the day. But uh, as far as who was responsible, I was responsible for, for it all because there was only uh, two salesmen and myself and 
couple of technicians, the total employment of first year was eight. Eight of us did the job. And the new car business, I ordered the new cars and, and kind of took care of it and was one of the salesmen when everybody else was busy. So it was kind of a jack of all trades. And then you mentioned Grandpa, your dad, working with you. Um, and did he work in the used car building a little bit, or was he over in the in the new car showroom? And then you also had um, your brother-in-law working with you, Stu. Um, and I think he came at a certain time. Maybe he was in the service with Vietnam and came at some point while we were still downtown. Can you tell us a little bit about Grandpa's role and uh, your brother-in-law Stu's role? And Stu um, came with us for a short time and then was was drafted and spent a good time in Vietnam, came back, and then he became our new car sales manager and uh, did a great job. Nice, good person, good values, and did a great job. And then we, uh, in addition to that, then we had a used car manager, Chuck Galoose, and uh, Ch- Chuck did a, uh, also did a good job. It was a little tough first. Chuck would appraise a car, and they wasn't sure that the and the salesmen weren't sure that he was right. So they'd still come to me and say, "Do you think that's the right amount for that car?" They weren't ready to to listen to anyone other than the old guy himself. But they got used to it, and it all worked out well. And both those guys were with us for a long, long time. And uh, you also had uh, an employee, uh, Rob Schwartz, who was with you for a long time. Tell us a little bit about Rob's history. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us today, um, but uh, he was a part of the Elhart uh, business and family for a lot, a lot of years. And Rob came to work with us. We At first, we had one person taking care of the parts department and writing repair orders. He was a service manager and parts manager. Then as we grew, we uh, invited Rob to come to work with us and he was parts man at Reliable Cycle, and so he came to work with us. I'll never forget, I went, he was alone, single, 19 years old, and went to meet his parents, and and uh, because I really wanted to hire him and let them uh, know that I was for real and, and would take good care of him. And Rob did a, a nice, nice job. He would come into the parts department and... and uh, there were parts there that still belonged to 1930 automobiles and a part of the whole investment of going into business. And I walked in the parts department here, he's dumping that stuff out. I said, Rob, what are you doing? You're throwing away the parts. He said, they're parts for no cars that are on the road today. So he had to get rid of them. Then a sad thing happened to Rob. He had a, a stroke, a form of stroke, and he lost all power from his waist down. He was totally paralyzed. But um, and Wayne came to me and said, Dad, Rob can still do the job. We'll have to do some altering, change the bathroom and, and change uh, the switches for the overhead doors and all in a write-up area from him. But he, he can still do the job, and he did. And we were invited, thanks to Rob and his customer satisfaction, to a seminar uh, where Pontiac took, I think it was 12 service managers from the nation and and had a conference and talked with them about how they handle different problems and so on. And Rob and uh, his wife Jeannie were invited to that, uh, and uh, they invited Margaret and I to come along, and it was just a super experience, and Rob did a great job through the years. And we could go on and on about all the, all the wonderful employees uh, that you had for years, Fred Hanko and... The Lohman brothers and and um, all all kinds of all, all lots of wonderful employees that gave um, their lives to this business, and and being part of a, a great business in the community is involves community involvement, and uh, you were involved in a lot of different things. One being the Tulip Time uh, Parade, and you gave of a lot of vehicles, particularly convertibles. Here's a, a 1966 September. A uh, shot of an old Catalina or Bonneville. Why don't you tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, what you did with with respect to the uh, Tulip Time Parade and in, in cars. I think it was close to forty years that the mothers of the twins would always come in and ask for a car, a parade car, 
and they wanted to pull a float, but they want one big enough so it was raining and cold that they didn't have to sit outside with their babies. So we'd find a big station wagon for them where they could pull the float and still be inside on cold days. And it went on for years and years. This picture is uh, when I first become a dealer, I said, and that was in March, I said, you know, in May, we're having tulip time here. And it'd be awful nice to have some convertibles. And so they shipped us this nice red Bonneville convertible. It looked like it was 80 feet long. And uh, and a couple of Le Mans convertibles for the, for the parade for the first year. And this is a picture of the, of the Bonneville. Uh, my favorite convertible was the GTO Judge, that orange uh, with a wing in the back. And that was, uh, I think Mom got to drive that for a little bit. And, and tell us a little bit about that GTO Judge. One thing we had to do is, to, is Stu got the Jeff and his brother Wayne together and said, now I'm going to check the depth of, the, of these tires the grooves to make sure that you're not burning river every night on on uh, 32nd Street and wearing the tires out. I don't know whether it did it any good, but he threatened them with a gauge. Um, and then your community involvement. You were involved with uh, uh, with a number of community uh, leadership roles, uh, Board of Public Works, First Michigan Bank, among just a few. Um, uh, why don't you tell us about your memories of working, first of all, um, as, as a member of the Board of uh, Directors for First Michigan Bank. Um, Bob Denherter and, and uh, Randy Decker called on me and said, we'd like you to be a director of the bank. And um, I didn't know whether it was because I owed them so much money that they wanted to keep their eye on me or what, but I was... Uh, Certainly pleased with the invitation and, and uh, served. And it was a tremendous learning experience for me to, to have that education as far as accounting and, and uh, so on. So it, uh, I, I'm sure that I learned more than I gave, but it, uh, I was happy to serve on the board. Yeah. And, and then uh, you got involved with the Holland Board of Public Works, um, and you r reached the presidency of that board. Uh, tell us what drew you to the Holland Public Board of, uh, board of Public Works and, and your experience then. Uh, Bob Walbrink uh, from, from Holland here uh, was a director, one of the directors of the Board of Public Works, and he moved with his wife uh, down on the Kalamazoo River uh, up river from from uh, Saugatuck and Douglas, and so they needed to fill that vacancy, and I asked if I would consider serving on that, and so I did. <laughs> the first meeting, they said, uh, "Did you bring a straw along?" And I said, "A straw? What for?" Well, he said, "You got to go down and test and make sure the waste treatment plant is working okay." And I thought they were serious, but they weren't. <laughs> I was ready to resign right then. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was a year and a half. And you, t you could uh, serve two five-year terms. So in addition to that, I served 10 years collectively and went through the ranks in the last five years was as its president. And it, it was, it, I had to learn to be patient when you deal with city government or any government. Take some patience to let it take its time. And in a small business, the, you just didn't do it that way. You made up your mind, you made a decision and got it done. But um, it worked out really well. When I was on the two peaking units across from Elsinghen Valkers, we purchased those, uh, purchased 10 megawatts of, of power from the Campbell plant out at uh, Port Sheldon. And... Um, Holland did not have enough capacity to bring enough current in to run the community should something happen to the James D. Young plant. Uh, the manufacturing and all would have to shut down. So during while I was on, they did what they called the loop, get enough heavy, heavy cabling and, and capacity 
to have water to, to have power, you know, south, way beyond Heworth and north on the north side, it was done. It was several million, in fact, hundred million, but um, it was well worth while, and it's still in effect today and with capacity to handle the community. And uh, one of your passions, uh, when you weren't working, which you were working uh, a lot of hours, um, and Wayne and I respected that and uh, always admired uh, your work ethic. And, uh, you know, it's because of your leadership in our lives, uh, we became hard workers and work worth doing, as Teddy Roosevelt would say. And uh, But one of the things you really enjoyed in Maybe that was uh, maybe it was born from your involvement in the Coast Guard, but you really love boating, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, but you mentioned you had a twenty-seven foot Chris Craft. Uh, I've got some pictures here of a thirty-five foot Romer steel hull and a, I think it was a forty-one foot, maybe forty-two foot Chris Craft double cabin. Uh, tell us a little bit about your boats um, from chronologically, uh, what you can remember and what you liked about them and kind of favorite moments? We never, you know, could afford to get a brand new boat and we'd get one that needed some tender loving care. And the first cabin cruiser was a 27-foot uh, Chris Craft, wooden boat, of course, and and uh, enjoyed it a lot. And that's the one that that we got involved in the heavy storm up in the, you know, up in the Straits of Mackinac. And then from there, we went to a 35-foot Romer, a steel hull. Um, we, what did they use as fenders on that before you bought that? They used old black tire casings. <laughs> we couldn't scrub the, the black marks off. Had to paint the whole thing because of it. That boat, we, we took your mother and I, took you and a friend, and Wayne and a friend, and we came from Holland into Manistee just as the marina was closing. And I said, I said are you still open where we can get gas? He looked at the boat and he said, a roamer, huh? Steel hull? Yeah. yeah. How far did you come, Holland? I'll open back up for that <laughs> because of that Thursday. Then we had, uh, well, the boat that we had in, in uh, Escanaba that you were on, that was the... Is that Shepherd or? Uh, that was the Chris Craft, um, uh, or was that the Romer? Or I mean the the Richardson. Richardson, the Richardson, a big sedan. We felt it was nice, you know, to we'd go out and sleep overnight on it on a weekend or something, and to have the additional room. And that was that was a nice boat. And then we sold that and bought a 40, 41 foot Chris Craft. And after the Chris Craft, we bought a, a new 40, we got a new boat, and it was a 40-foot trawler, and we enjoyed it a lot. I had a lot of fun with it. And uh, the nicest thing that anyone could say to me, we took it to Saugatuck to stay overnight and have dinner there, and we didn't take any shore cords or anything. And somebody walked past and walked and looked at the boat and looked at us and said, is that an antique boat that you're redoing? And I thought, <laughs> hot dog. I, I, I got a traditional boat. Uh, there was one really scary moment um, for our family when we were on the boat. Um, I was a little tyke, and uh, I fell in the water. Do you recall that? I never forget it. But tell us a little bit about that and... I'll never forget it. Jeff went up to the bathroom or something and come back, sat on the, the dock and put his feet on the boat, and the boat moved away and down he went into the water. And I out of there and it was all I could see because Lake Bankatau is not clear water, was see the top of that red head, and I jumped right in and grabbed it and come back up and treaded water and somebody else laid on the dock and pulled Jeff out and then me. And so, and we were having our dinner in the boat. And we got back in, and Jeff, somebody, Wayne or his mother, something, and Jeff, 
you got to be careful or made some statement and we said, well, I got to see the bottom anyway. <laughs> and I couldn't swim at that age. I couldn't swim. So dad saved my life. That was a monumental moment. Um, there's something here that uh, we're going to go off topic here, but uh, here's an envelope and it's uh, labeled from dad and Sylvia. Dad was um, gra my grandpa, Ted, and my grandma, Sylvia, to Ken, to my dad here. I want you to open this up and, and read this. And uh, very interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Ken, when you were real small, so don't remember how old you were. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But you wanted to go into banking. And you started with this penny. <coughs> Excuse me. This is how you got the good start. This is a penny that I swallowed as a baby. This is a penny that I swallowed as a baby. They called the doctor and the doctor laughed and said, oh, I guess he's going to be a banker. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, he said, just watch. You pass it. And so this made the rounds. <laughs> this is a penny that I swallowed once upon a time. And either Grandpa and Grandma had the, the privilege of of finding that. It's hard to tell a, a year on it, but I'm sure an expert probably could tell. Uh, but it's a, it's the first time I've ever seen it. It's on Pontiac uh, um, Stenopad, Elhart Pontiac, and it had the GTO emblem, the Firebird emblem, and the People's State Bank. Um, Call Robert Rickson and William Unk. Um, so this must have been uh, provided by People State Bank with our logos at the time. Yeah. Um, let's turn our head for a moment to uh, you know someone that's dear, near and dear to your heart and my heart and the whole Elhart family's heart, and that's your son Wayne. Um, and uh, tell us a, a little bit about uh, his character, um, it being a good boy and maybe not being a not so good boy, and what you think made him tick and uh, his legacy today. Well, Wayne was was an interesting, fun-loving kid. Uh, he started out as a little guy, where he didn't want to really be away from his mother all that much, and if we would, if we would. Uh, be going out, and he had a babysitter there, he'd be standing in the doorway, don't go, mama, don't go, mama. And then in church, Sunday school, I would take him to Sunday school, and he didn't want to stay there without me, and I'd sit on a stool for a while until he got involved, and I'd get up, and he'd see that just bingo, and he'd be right back with me. He just, very shy, never was one to, to I mean, you know, to the kids that he knew in school, he was it was okay. But anyway, um, Wayne was mischievous, and he, and he'd get in a little trouble in school, and the uh, the teacher would, you know, would have to reprimand him some, and and his mother uh, would get embarrassed about parent teachers interview. He says, I just can't go again. I said, well, I'll go <laughs> take the heat. <laughs> but he, he, he was kind of the town clown, and yet everybody loved him. And when he got through high school and went on to college, many of the instructors, if they'd be in town on vacation, would stop and say hello to him. He was well-liked, well-thought-of, and good-natured. One of the employees here, his daughter was going on a spring break deal to Mexico, and everybody was bringing a certain camera or something, and and she wasn't going to be able to get one. And Wayne came to her and said, I've got one that I want you to have. I'm sick of it anyway. You just keep it. And that was Wayne, and that was the type of guy he was. And, you know, it brings a tear to your eye. He he loved people. He not, I can't tell you just when, but he came to me one day and he said, you know, Dad, all your friends are getting older, and we should take a ride out 
to your old neighborhood and stop and say hello to those folks. Now, I didn't think about it, but he did, and we did. We spent an afternoon visiting the old farm neighborhood, and, uh, you know, what a neat deal that, that he was that thoughtful, but he always was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he was sent home one day from school uh, because of something he was wearing. you want to explain that? We went, I don't remember where he got, whether we went to Chicago to a boat show or something. Anyway, he got into some clothes in, in Paisley-type bright, bright pants he bought. And so one morning we were ready to leave, and I said, Wayne, I don't think that'll work wearing those pants to school as bright as they are. Well, he was going to wear them, and I said, I want you to know now that if you have to change them, I can't break away and come back and get you. You're going to have to walk to get it done. Well, he was willing to take the chance. We spent about three minutes in, in the homeroom class, and they noticed his britches and said, that won't work. And so said, you're going to have to change him. Well, he said to the instructor, it's going to take a while because my dad said if that happened, he'd ha I, I'd have to walk home and change him. And he said, Mr. Elhart, we're going to do our very best to get along without you till you get back. <laughs> and that was Wayne. <laughs> Yeah, he was one of a kind. They broke the mold on him. Um, we've got a lot of uh, history here, and we just hope that uh, uh, our friends have enjoyed the time with uh, hearing about Ken's life, about his personal life, his upbringing, um, his professional life, his community life, and his faith life. And uh, we just are thankful for to our all our friends uh, customers, community, and employees, and we're grateful for the time that you're spending to to view this. And we hope that this is an inspirational way in a way that um, you can take something out of this and um, use it for your good. So, thank you for your time. On behalf of the Elhart family, we wish you all the best and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>